Hi everyone. Welcome to the P2P session. for March 2022. Uh, let us wait for a couple of minutes for others to join and then we'll start. So let us start and uh, we were doing this question uh, in the last session and we were done with the, the cost of weighted average cost of capital that C part and uh, we were supposed to be calculating uh, the project specific cost of equity and then there was a discussion to be followed. So first of all, let's uh, solve the D part for the question which asks us to calculate project specific cost of equity for card company for the planned joint venture. So let us go through the question again. Uh, card company is planning to invest a, a significant amount of money into a joint venture in a new business area. It has identified a proxy company with a similar business risk to the joint venture. The proxy company has an equity beta of 1.038 and is financed by 75%, it's financed 75% by equity and 25% by debt on a market value basis. Risk free rate of return is 4%, the average equity risk premium is 5%, and tax rate is 30%, and equity, which is irrelevant in this part because we won't be using this uh, equity beta of the card company as it's it shows the existing business risk of the company. So we have to use the equity beta of the proxy company, and uh, first of all, we have to uh, ungear this beta, we have to remove the financial risk of this proxy company first and convert it into asset beta. Uh, so in order to convert it into asset beta, we have to multiply the equity beta, which is 1.038 into equity, uh, which is 75%. Uh, 75% divided by equity which is 75 plus debt which is 25 and has to be converted into after tax which is 30 percent so we have to take 70 percent of so it's 0 0.841622 so it's quite a big number let us reduce the decimal places to three so this is now the equity beta Sorry, this is now the asset beta. Now this is showing only the business risk. Now we have to 
re-gear it. And uh, for re-gearing, we have to use card companies. And uh, we've already calculated the market values of equity and debts. So we have to use the to convert it into equity beta. And companies that equity ratio to convert it into equity beta. Now the fraction will now be reversed. So it will be debt into 70% divided by equity. Asset beta into equity plus debt divided by equity. So it's point eight nine. Is it breaking now? Is it still breaking? Okay, so it's 0.895. Now, using the CAPM model, let us calculate cost of equity. The risk free rate of return is 4%. The equity beta is 0.895, and the equity risk premium is 5%. So the cost of equity will be four percent plus eight nine five five percent eight point four seven percent. So that's a project specific cost of equity now. The next part, the next part is asking us to discuss whether changing the capital structure of a company can lead to a reduction in its cost of capital, hence to an increase in the value of the company. Now, whenever you get this type of a question where they are linking capital structure with the value of the company and cost of capital, it is basically referring to different theories of capital structure first of all what is capital structure capital structure is basically the mix of debt and equity one company might have a different capital structure the other might have a different capital structure one might have um, might be 100 percent equity financed the other might be uh, partially equity finance and partially debt finance and then there might be another company which may be having a higher level of gearing than the other company so there will be different types of uh, uh, there will be a different mix of debt and equity for different companies. That's a capital structure. That's capital structure for companies. Now, what does what does this question? Uh, what what is this question asking for? It's asking for whether if a company changes its capital structure, that is, if it changes its gearing ratio 
or uh, let's suppose if a company is an all equity finance company and, not, and then decides to introduce debt into its capital structure. So it means it's changing its capital structure. So it is it, it is asking us to discuss whether if whether a, whether changing the capital structure of a company will have any sort of impact on cost of capital and on the value of the company. Now there are three theories uh, related to capital structure. Uh, the one is called traditional theory. The traditional theory uh, says that there is a connection between capital structure and cost of capital. And it says that when uh, when a company increases its debts from say 0% to let's say 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%, so if it increases its debts, its WEC or cost of capital will start decreasing. And the reason is, as you all know, that uh, debt is a cheaper source of finance, right? Now, if, a, if a, there is a company that has that is 100% equity financed, let's say, let us assume that the company is 100% equity financed. And let us assume that this company has a cost of equity of say 14%. So what will be the cost of capital of this company? If it has a cost of equity of 14%, what will be the cost of capital of this company? It will be the same 14% as it does not have any debts, right? So its cost of equity will be equal to its weighted average cost of capital at the moment but if it if, but if this company starts introducing debt debt into its capital structure what will happen is that at the moment 100% of its capital has come through equity and it's paying 14% on the whole capital as a return but if it adds debts let's say the new capital structure, let us assume, will be 20% debts and 80% equity. So it means that on 80% of the capital, it will be paying 14%. Whereas on the rest of the 20%, it will be paying less than 14% as debts are less riskier. Therefore, they will have less return. Say it's 6, 7%. Let, let me assume it's 7% later. So the cost of debt is 7%. Now the weighted average cost of capital in this case will now be the weighted average of these two. So let us calculate. 80% into 14% plus 14 plus 20% into 7. So it will be 12.6%. The new WAC will be 12.6%. Now it has reduced from 14% to 12.6%. So with this new capital structure, the WAC has decreased. And the reason is the introduction of a cheaper source of finance. The reason is the introduction of cheaper source of finance. So according to the traditional theory, it will keep on reducing as the gearing level increases. But it says that after a certain point, after a certain point, when you will be increasing your debts, the, the creditors will start feeling risk. They will, they will, they will feel that there is now a risk involved in granting credit to such company that has already a higher level of gearing. So beyond a certain point, beyond a certain level of gearing, the creditors, because of feeling higher level of risk, will start expecting a higher return. That is the cost of debt will start increasing. It will no more be 7%. It will start increasing because of the higher level of financial risk. 
and as a result the vac of the company will start increasing again and uh, the relationship can be shown with the help of this graph that as you increase your gearing let us assume that the gearing level is on the x axis so when the gearing will increase the vac will start, will, will be decreasing but after a certain point it will start increasing again so according to traditional theory there will be a point where the vac of the company will be minimum and that particular point of gearing will be called optimum capital structure where your vac will be minimum that is your cost of capital will be minimum and what at whatever gearing you achieve this point that point will be called optimum capital structure say for example the, if the gearing level of a company goes to let's say 35 percent and let us assume that the vac is minimum at 35 percent of gearing that means that 35 percent will be debts and 65 percent will be equity so for this particular company 65 percent equity and 35 percent debts that capital structure will be the optimum capital structure as its vac will be minimum so the company has to make sure in this case that its capital structure remains the same because if it keeps this level of capital structure its work will be minimum and whatever project it undertakes will have minimum cost of capital and there will be highest level of NPV and because of highest level of NPV the value of the company at this capital structure will be maximum so according to traditional theory a cap, a, a, an optimum capital structure exists and an optimum capital structure is a point where work of the company will be minimum and the value of the company will be maximum so every company has to find out that optimum capital structure for itself and then and the company has to ensure that it keeps the same level of gearing throughout so it means that whenever it is it is required to raise capital it should ensure that the new capital should be raised in the same ratio that is let's say in this case 65% and 35% and according to traditional theory if it does so every project that it undertakes will give maximum net present value for the business uh, for the business so that's the theory so this is the traditional theory of capital structure so whenever you get a question of this type you have to present capital structure theories of which one is traditional theory that i just explained now in contrast to this theory there is another theory of capital structure and it is it is it was presented by modigliani and miller the mm theory according to this theory capital structure has nothing to do with vac and value of the company they say capital structure is irrelevant and there is no connection between capital structure and value of the company why do they say this first of all they say that if you want to increase your value of the company if you want to increase your value of the company according to mm there are only two ways where you can increase the value of the company number one increase your earnings because if investors start believing that the company can generate more and more earnings only then only then they will be willing to pay a higher price for the share of the company so according to mm if a company wants to increase its value if management wants to increase the value of the company they have to increase the earnings of the company number one or they have to reduce the business risk of the company the lower the risk 
the higher will be the confidence of the investors in the company and they will be willing to pay a higher price because they feel that the risk is lower. So either reduce the volatility in the income that is reducing the risk or increase the income. That these are the two only ways according to MM the company can increase its value. Now, why do they think capital structure has nothing to do with the VAC and then value of the company? They have an assumption and that assumption is that let's say let's say a company is 100% geared and it has cost of equity of 14% so cost of equity and cost of capital is 14% let's say now there's the the mm theory says that if if you increase if you increase your gearing level say for example if we introduce 20 percent debts to our capital structure and let us assume that cost of debt is eight percent so they say that if you increase your gearing ratio to 20 percent your shareholders because of the financial risk which was not which, which, which was never there before because of the financial risk they will ask for a higher return now they won't settle for 14 percent anymore this 14 percent was only acceptable when there was no financial risk they knew that once the business is generating enough operating profits they will be getting their dividends but now since they know even after having operating profit the company has to pay for the interest as well and maybe after paying interest there is nothing left for the shareholders so they are, they've started feeling that risk and because of that financial risk now they will be asking for a higher return than 14 percent and MM has assumed that the investors in the market, they will be very rational, very knowledgeable. They will have perfect knowledge. So they will respond. They will respond and they will ask for a higher return. And they will ask for a level of return that will keep whack of the company constant. Like for example, how do we calculate VAC? We calculate VAC by Picking up the cost of equity, multiplying it by equity divided by equity plus debt. That's the proportion of equity plus cost of debt into debt divided by equity plus debt. So we take weighted average of cost of equity and cost of debt and we calculate back, right? So according to MM, the cost of equity will change and we don't know to what level it will change. Let us do some reverse calculation. So it says that the cost of equity will change in such a way that it keeps your cost of capital constant. That is 14%. So it will keep the cost of capital cost of capital constant as 14%. Now the equity is 80% because we have 80% of debts and cost of debt, which is 8% into 20%. So can you people find out what the cost of equity will be with this equation? Take 20% of eight. What will be the 20% of eight? 1.6, this 1.6% will now be subtracted from here. Twelve point four, and that's twelve point four will will be divided by eighty percent. Twelve point four will be divided by eighty percent. So.
So cost of equity will increase to 15.5%. It will be 15.5%. So the investors who were earlier on good with 14% of return will now start asking for 15.5% return because of the financial risk. And because the cost of equity will increase from 14 to 15.5%, it will keep your call back constant. And now from here onwards, you, you keep on increasing the gearing level. The investors will start asking for a higher return in such a way that your cost of capital will remain same at 14% and it will not change throughout. So you keep on increasing your gearing ratio, you, there will be no impact on the VAC. And if, and if there is no impact on the VAC, it will have no impact on the value of the company as well. So that's how MM proves its point that there is no connection between capital structure and value of the company. That's the MM version of capital structure theory. Is that clear? Okay, so you can go to your PPP textbook or Kaplan textbook. There is there 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 are the details related to the capital structure theories, and you just have to note on the main points of that theory. And when whenever you get a question about the connection of capital structure theories with the value of the company, you can just simply refer to that textbook matter and you can just write it in, in your exams. I've just given you the explanation, the rationale of how these theories work. Now you can write in your words the way you want to. Okay. Did you people try this MTQ? Okay, we have already done questions related to uh, this uh, uh, MTQ. So I'll share the solution about this MTQ. And also I'll share a recorded lecture related to this MTQ as well, once you will solve it. So do you want this MTQ to try yourself? Or do you want me to, to solve it for you now? My suggestion is that you should try this MTQ because it's a simple one. It is, uh, it's a very simple one and we have done. Yeah, you should try it yourself and I'll share the video solution to this question later on. Because I want to move towards the working capital now and the risk management part. Yeah, my lectures are available on Vimeo as well. On ACC Pakistan's page. Okay, let's start with the working capital now. Oscar company designs and produces tracking devices. The company is managed by its four founders who lack business administration skills. The company has a revenue of $28 million and all sales are on 30 days credit. Its major customers are large multinational car manufacturing companies and are often late in paying their invoices. Oscar company is a rapidly growing company and revenue has doubled in the last four years. Oscar company has focused 
in this time on product development and customer services and managing trade receivable has been neglected. Oscar company average trade receivable are currently at 5.37 million and bandits are 2% of credit sales revenue partly as a result of poor credit control. The company has suffered a shortage of cash and it has recently reached its over draft limit. The four founders have spent large amounts of time chasing customers for payments. In an attempt to improve trade receivable management, Oscar has approached a factory company. The factory company has offered two possible options. Administration by the factor of Oscar's company's invoicing, sales accounting and receivable collection on a full recourse basis. The factor would charge a service fee of 0.5% of credit sales revenue per year. Oscar company estimate that this would result in saving of $30,000 per year in administration costs. Under this arrangement, the trade receivables collection period would be 30 days. Administration by the factor of Oscar's invoicing, sales, accounting, and receivable collection on a non recourse basis, the factor would charge a service fee of 1.5% of the credit sales revenue per year. Administration cost savings and every trade receivable collection period would be as option one. Oscar company would be required to accept an advance of 80% of credit sales when invoices are raised at an interest rate of 9% per year. Oscar company pays interest on its overdraft at 7% per year and the company operates 365 days a year. Calculate the benefits and costs of each option one, each of the option one and two and comment on your findings. Okay, so let's talk about option one first. So in option one, option one is a recourse factoring, which means that uh, uh, the responsibility or, or loss of the bandits will still be borne by the company and not the factor. And a non recourse factoring is one in which the risk of bad debts or the loss of the bad debts will be borne by the factor and the company will no more be bearing this loss. That's the difference between the two. So let us see how much it is going to cost and what will be the benefits of going with the option one. Uh, the first benefit of going with option one will be the saving in administration cost. Saving in administration cost of $30,000. $30,000. So Oscar's average trade receivable are currently 5.37 million, right? So after it goes for factoring, the receivable period will be of 30 days. Now, one thing that you people should always remember, I'm just giving you a statement which will help you always whenever it comes to receivable management. And that statement is account receivable of a company will always be equal to credit sales of credit period, right? Your account receivable will be equal to credit sales of your credit period. I'm not talking about the credit period that you have given your customers it's a, it's the actual credit period that the customers take to pay you back like in this example the, the the decided credit period is 30 days but it is saying that the customers are not paying within that time so i'm not talking about this formal credit period it's the actual credit period that matters so at the moment if we don't go for with factoring the receivable of the company will be 5.37 million 
So what are we supposed to be doing is to find out our revised account receivable. So let me go to the working section. Current account receivable is five three seven zero thousand and that's in thousands that's current account receivable and it's in thousands so after factoring it will the it will reduce it will uh, make sure that the customers pay within 30 days right so now the revised account receivable will be equal to 30 days of sales 30 days of sales now what's the annual figure of sales 28 million 28 million 28000 we should divide it by 365 to get the daily sales figure if we divide it by 365 it will give us a daily sales figure and then we have to multiply it by the credit period to calculate the account receivable balance so the revised account receivable balance will now be 2301 just look at this 28000 is the annual sales figure divided by 365 will give us a daily sales figure and if you multiply it with 30, it will give us the sales figure equal to 30 days, which is the credit period. So account receivable balance will be equal to this. Now there is a reduction in the account receivable. That's a reduction in the account receivable. Because of this reduction in the account receivable, the company will be able to save its finance cost. So saving in finance cost because of the factoring will be the overdraft rate the existing overdraft rate The saving will be the existing overdraft rate, which is seven percent. Seven percent into the reduction in account receivable. Two one five into thousand. 214804 that's the saving in finance cost because of the reduction in account receivable is that clear Which one are you talking about, Arabia? What do you want to explain again? Okay, tell me what do you want me to go through again? Is this the problem with all others as well? Are you people having some problems?
No, I'm not talking. Can you people hear me properly? Okay, let me explain again. The current account receivable is 5370, which is given in the question. Right? But after factoring, the factor will ensure that our creditors pay us, our, our debtors pay us within 30 days. So the revised account receivable figure will be the annual sales in, divided by 365 into 30. So that will be the revised receivable figure. So without factoring, it was 5370. Now with factoring, it will be 2301. So there is a reduction of 3069 in the receivable and as a result it will save us finance cost the rate of finance cost is seven percent so the saving will be seven percent of this reduction in account receivable that's it seven percent of the account receivable since it's a it's a recourse factoring since it's a recourse factoring there will be no saving in the bad debts and there are no other savings in option two. So the total savings will be some of these two. That's the total savings. Now against these savings, the factor will be charging us its fee. So let us see what's the fee. Less factors fee, which is 0.5% of the credit sales. 0.5% of credit sales and the credit sales figure is 28 million 140,000 so the fee will be 144,000 140,000 and the savings are 244804 so net benefit in case of option 1 will be 104 804 so in case we don't have any other option on financial grounds we can suggest that the company should be going for this factoring arrangement but since we have option two as well so we cannot recommend option one at the moment download both of them and uh, the one having more questions will be the latest one. Fazan, we don't need to show we don't need to show bad debts in option one because without factoring even without factoring even bad debts will be there. So even if you go for option one, even if you go for option one, there will be no saving in the bad debts. So better not to show bad debts now, but we will be showing bad debts as savings in option two. Option two. In option two, we will again have savings in administration cost and it will be the same. Thirty thousand. And uh, let us calculate finance cost. option two in case of option two let us see what will be the finance cost okay you all know we all know that the uh, current finance cost cost will be seven percent of current account receivable which is five three seven zero and let us multiply it by a thousand as well it's not that big figure so that's your that's our current finance cost if 
we don't go for any factoring option, the finance cost for the company will be 375900. So revised finance cost. Cost will be for that we first need to find out a revised account receivable figure. And revised account receivable figure will be the same as we calculated here. 2301. But there's a slight difference between the previous option and this option. In this option, the factor will give advance of 80%. So 80% of account receivables will now be financed through the factor at a rate of 9% and the rest of the 20% will still be financed through the existing rate. That's the change in the finance cost now. So the revised finance cost will now be on 80% receivables. This, this is the revised receivable figure and 80% of this for, will be charged at 9%. And it will be 165.70 multiplied by 1000. And on 20% receivables, to 20% it will still be 7% multiplied with 1000 so that's that will be the revised finance cost the sum of the two The revised finance cost will be 197918. The existing one is 375900. So there is again saving, saving in finance cost. 375900 minus 197. 177982. The saving previously was higher than it is now. And this reason is earlier the whole receivables, the whole of the receivables were financed through a 7% rate, through 7% rate, whereas now 80% of the receivable has an interest cost of 9%, whereas the 20% has a cost of 7%. So that's why the saving isn't that much at it as it was in option one. Most of it, I'll get back to your point. First, tell me, is it clear how I have calculated the revised finance cost and the saving in the finance cost? Is that clear to everyone? Okay, so that's the saving. Okay, then comes the bad debts cost. Now, bad debts in this case is not a cost, it's actually the saving. Saving in bad debts. Saving in bad debts. So, what was the bad debts percentage? Bad debts are 2% of credit sales. Okay. It was a cost and now it will be saved as it's a non recourse factoring. So 2% of 5370 That's again the saving. So we have three types of savings in option two saving in administration costs, saving in finance costs, and savings in bad debts cost. 
let us add all these three. So the total savings because of option two will be 315382. Now let us subtract the factors fee, which is now 1.5% of the credit sales. 5370. It should have been more than this. It's coming less than this. Oh, I'm sorry. We should multiply it with the revenue figure. And that's what I'm wondering. 28. That's, that's 420,000. So option two if we go for option two there will be net loss of one zero four six one eight despite saving in bad debt costs we won't we will be making a loss of one zero four six one eight now which option is better option one so that's our suggestion that the company should go for option one is it clear now yes when we have done enough of a calculation, then comment is basically, in this case, a decision. That's it. We have to give our decision. That, that's what is meant by the comment here. Discuss reasons other than cost benefit already calculated why Oscar company may benefit from the services offered by the factoring company. Bad debts, you have to look at the percentage. No? Uh, Fazan, they have given us, look at this, they have given a percentage, 2% of credit sales. So if they've clearly mentioned that it's 2% of the credit sales, then we definitely have to apply it to the credit sales figure. And remember one thing, bad debts is never ever calculated as a percentage of receivable. It's a provision for bad debt that's calculated on the basis of account receivable figure. Did we use receivable figure? Let me check it out. Let me check it out. I'm sorry if, if I have done this mistake. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's my mistake. That's my mistake. I, I thought that it's a sales figure. That's why I was using it for the for the factor fee as well. It's 28. Here we go. So quite a big saving and the decision has changed. Thank you so much, uh, Fazan, for correcting me. I just mistakenly took this figure as sales figure. So now it's the net benefit. 34792.
Thank you, Musavir. You also pointed out this. Okay, now let's go to the discussion part, the second part, where they are asking us to discuss reasons other than cost and benefit already calculated why Oscar may benefit from the services offered by the factoring company. So do you people have any clue? Why? Uh, other than the cost and benefits that we have calculated, how factor can benefit the company? Saving and administration cost has already been taken into account. They're saying other than whatever we have considered so far, other than that, what may be the benefits? Excellent, Fatima. That's one of the biggest benefits of going for factoring arrangement that uh, running after as they've mentioned here as well that the management was taking spending so much time and money for uh, chasing the receivables right so uh, chasing receivables can never be a core activity of of businesses like oscar so uh, they need time to spend on their core functions but if they are asked they're after the receivables every time they will lose their focus they will not be focusing on their unique selling points, their core activities. So one of the biggest benefits of uh, having a uh, of, uh, having factor will be that the management will have more time to focus on their core activities. So this is one of the benefits. Then what what might be the second benefit? Yes, the second problem is the liquidity. They will help us manage our liquidity. They will ease out our liquidity problems. Second, third. Any other benefit? I think that's that's bad debts now when we have already considered bad debts as as a saving as a benefit so other than that what what other benefits may be there if we are going for factoring The third is, uh, again, uh, uh, if we use factoring, it means that we don't have to have a credit control department. And if we, will, if we won't have credit control department, it means it will be much easier for us to manage the company as now we will have less number of employees to look after, less number of departments to look after. So the administration, I'm not talking about the cost, the administration, the hassle of the administration will also be reduced. Because when you have more people, there'll be more problems as well. So with less number of people, and especially you are removing a department that is not your core department. So you will be free of hassles that come with credit control department. So that's another advantage of having factoring. 
Discuss three factors that determine the level of company's investment in working capital. What are the three factors on the basis of which a company decides how much it should be investing in the working capital? Three factors. Yes, the type of the business or the nature of the business. That's a better word to use. Nature of the business. If you are a service business, you don't have to invest more in inventory. On the other hand, if you have a if, if you are a manufacturing business, you will have to keep inventory in form of raw material, in the form of working process, in the form of finished goods. So we'll have more inventory levels as compared to a service business. So the nature of the business is one of the main factors of the decision beyond, be, behind the level of company's investment. Second, what may be another factor? Size of the business, yeah, the trading volume, the overall trading volume of a business. If you are a bit, if you have a high trading volume, obviously to support that high trading volume, you need to have a high level of investment in your working capital. You need to have um, a high level of cash, high level of inventory, more receivables. Third, yes, the seasonal factor. If you are a seasonal business and from one season to another season, you may have to invest more in your working capital. Fourth is the, is the attitude of the management, at the attitude of the management, the risk appetite. Whether the management is aggressive or it's conservative, so it's also it also depends on uh, the management's attitude towards the risk. Yeah, so these are the factors based on which the level of investment is determined by any company. So I got a request from one of the students. I don't know if he's present or if he, she's present in the class. Uh, it was P and P PLC, right? May I know who was it? Who was the student who asked for this question? Okay, it was Fatma. Okay. So do you are, are you people sure that I should? Go with this question because it's a very tricky question. It's a very good question for for understanding, but it's a difficult one as well. So if you people want, I, I, I'll go through it. Okay. Okay, let's go through it then. What are we supposed to be doing? Calculate the net benefit or cost of increasing the discount for early payment and comment on the acceptability of the proposal. Now, let's go through the question. The following financial information relates to PNP PLC, a UK based firm for the year just ended. Sales revenue, variable cost of sales, inventory, receivables, payables. Okay. They have divided their receivables into four parts class one, class two, class three, and overseas. Class one, they pay within 30 days. Class two, they pay with, within 60 days. Class three, they pay within 75 days. Uh, the class one, they, they get 1% uh, early settlement discount as well, whereas the irrecoverable uh, debts won't be there in this class, but there will be bad debts in the other classes. The receivable balance given are before taking account of irrecoverable debts.
All sales are on credit. Production and sales take place evenly throughout the year. Currently, sales are for each class of receivables are in proportion to their relative year and balances before irrecoverable debts. It has been proposed that the discount for early payment be increased from 1% to 1.5% for settlement within 30 days. It is expected that this will lead to 50% of existing class 2 receivables becoming class 1 receivables as well as attracting new business worth 500, um, 500 pounds in revenue, 500,000 pounds in revenue. The new business would be divided equally between class 1 and class 2 receivables. Fixed cost would not increase as a result of reducing the discount or buttering new business. PNP finances receivables from an old draft at an annual interest rate of 8%. Okay, it, it, if you people listen carefully, it won't be confusing anymore. Okay, we have to calculate the net benefit or cost of increasing this discount policy. Now, if they're, they're, they're increasing their discount from 1% to 1.5%, if, if uh, uh, the, 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 the debtors they pay within 30 days, right? So, because of that, there will be a few changes. And we have to calculate those changes now. Uh, so we will solve in pieces and then we'll com compile all the calculations that we do, right? Firstly, let's talk about. Uh, uh, the cost of discount. Let's talk about the cost of discount first. Currently, we are giving 1% discount. And uh, it is only available to, to, the, to the customers who are paying within, within 30 days. And those who are paying within 30 days, they have an account receivable balance of 200,000. So, sales from class one this is the class that is currently getting the discount right so let us calculate what's the total sales for the whole year related to class one customers those who pay us within 30 days so from the receivable balance we have to convert this receivable balance into sales figure so this receivable balance is equal to 30 days sales right so let us divide 200000 by 30 to get the daily sales figure this is the daily sales figure from class 1 receivables and uh, how many days do we have to assume In a year how many days do we have to assume they haven't given us days right so in f9 remember if they haven't asked us to assume number of days in a year we should always assume 365 days into 365 so from class to one receivables we have a total sales of two four three 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 whatever That's the total sales we generate from class one. And on this, we are currently giving 1% discount. So current cost of discount is 1% of this figure. So 24,333 is the current cost of discount. Is that okay? Okay, now we have to find out the revised cost of discount. 
for that we have to calculate the revised class one receivable because discount will still be available for those who pay within 30 days but this time the percentage will be 1.5 percent but the class one sales figure will now be different so let's look at the increase in sales because of uh, look at this it is expected that this will lead to 50 percent of existing class two receivables becoming class one receivables and also it will increase our sales by 500,000 and of the 500,000 250,000 sales will be related to class one and uh, 250,000 will be related to class two so now the total class one sales will be current so the current class one receivable will remain current sales will remain the same that's it two four three three then we have class two fifty percent of the class two no this was it fifty percent yes fifty percent of class two receivables will now be converted into class one so class two becoming class one firstly let's convert the receivable of class two into sales of class two from the receivable we have to convert it into the sales of class two and then we'll take 50 percent of that so two five two triple zero divided by 60 per day sales into 365 this will give us the total sales that we are currently generating from class two receivables that's the annual sales that we are generating from class two receivables and 50 percent of this will be converted into class one now and they'll be getting the discount 50 percent of this figure and that's seven six six five double zero these receivables earlier on these sales were earlier on paid in 60 days now they will be paid within 30 days as they will be getting discount as well then new sales will also be added to class one which is 50 percent of that total additional sales 500,000 50 percent of 500,000 it is already a revenue figure so no, no need of conversion it's already the revenue figure 250,000 so now the total class one sales will be and revised cost of discount will be 1.5 percent of this figure five one seven four seven point five dollars so additional discount will be two seven four one four point one seven dollars that's the additional cost of discount add discount cell reference please i didn't get it what are you saying
Okay, now let's talk about the finance cost, the impact of this policy on the finance cost. Finance cost. So, current finance cost will be equal to current account receivable into the finance rate. So, current account receivable, this is the current account receivable figure 744500 into the finance rate, which is 8%. That's what the current cost of finance is. Now let's talk about revised finance cost. For that, we need to have revised account receivable figures as well. Class one receivables. First, let's let us find the class one receivables. The class one receivables could easily be found, calculated with the help of class one sales. Total class one sales. Here we go. That's the total credit sales figure of class one. We have to convert this into the receivable. So all we have to do is to pick this total class one sales, divided by three sixty five, and multiplied by thirty to find the class one receivable figure the revised class one receivable figure it's two eight three five four seven point nine five that's the revised account receivable figure for class one current finance cost seems wrong why we can't take average days into why do we have to do that all because currently they have already given us the account receivable figure. If they already have given us the account receivable figure, we don't need to do anything. We just need to multiply the finance rate with that. Fazan, if we already know what's the account receivable figure, we don't need to do any other calculation, just need to multiply it with the finance rate. Is it okay? Did you get it? So we already have the account receivable figure. So that's class one receivables now. Now that's the revised credit account class one receivable figure. Is it clear? I just picked the total sales figure of class one, which is for the 365 days, and converting it to the account receivable figure of 30 days. So I've converted this annual figure into 30 days figure, which is the receivable figure. Is that clear? I'm waiting for all of your res response. Okay, then we have class two. Class two receivables. Class two receivables, you know that half of these receivables were converted into 
plus one. So we are left with half of these. Two, five, two, triple zero into 50%. Plus the new sales that were converted into class two receivables. 500,000, that's what the new sales figure. Half of this figure, half of this revenue figure was converted into class one receivable, which has already been included here. And half of this sales figure will be converted into class two and we have to convert it into a receivable figure because it's a revenue figure. So half of it, 500,000 into 50%. Into 50%. Into 60 divided by 365. 60 divided by 365. So 50% of 252,000 will still remain to be the class two receivables. And 50% of this revenue will be converted into class two receivable. But this is a revenue figure, right? So if we take 50% of this, it will give us half of the revenue figure and we have to convert it into receivables. We can't keep it as sales figures because we are calculating receivables. So we have to multiply it by 60 and divide it by 365 to convert it into receivable figures. So the revised class two receivable figure will be 167096. Now, is there any change to class three receivable because of this policy? Is there any change to class three receivables? So class three receivables won't change. So it will remain the same as it was one, one, zero, triple zero. And similarly, the overseas sales figure will re the receivable figure will remain the same. One eight two five zero zero. So now the total revised sales figure, uh, sorry, the total revised account receivable figure will be seven four three one four four. And revised finance cost will be eight percent of this. The five nine four five. So there isn't a big change in this, but still there is a saving in the finance cost. No big change in the finance cost. 59560 minus 59452. It's only 108. That's the saving the finance cost. Okay. Now let's talk about the additional contribution figure. Because of this policy, because of this policy, we are increasing our sales revenue by 500,000. And with this increase in sales, there will be additional contribution, right? And what is the additional contribution? For that, we need to calculate the current CS ratio, cost to, uh, contribution to sales ratio.
Can you guys hear me? Okay, sorry, there was a problem with the audio. So we have to calculate cost to say, uh, contribution to sales ratio with the help of the information given above from here. We need to calculate cost. Additional contribution will be equal to 500,000 Is it okay now? Is it okay now? Yeah, I'm just repeating it again, right? So first of all, we need to find out the contribution to sales ratio. For contribution to sales ratio, we have to subtract first the variable cost from the total sales. 5242, that's the sales minus the variable cost. It will give us the contribution figure. And then the contribution figure has to be divided by the sales figure to find out the contribution to sales ratio. So it's 40%. So contribution to sales ratio is 40%. And if we take 40% of 500,000, that is the additional sales, we will get the additional contribution figure. That's the additional contribution figure. So because of this policy, we will have additional contribution of 200,000. Then there is then we need to find out the bad debts as well. The bad debts figure will only change for class two. It won't change for any other class because there is no bad debts figure in class one. There is no change to class three receivables, no change to the overall, over, overseas receivables. So hence, there will be no change to any bad debts related to class one, three, and overseas. The only change that will be there in the bad debts will be related to class two as the class two receivable figure is going to change. So the existing bad debts figure related to class two is 12,600. And we need to see how much it will change after this policy. So what's the current percentage? Can you just calculate the current percentage of bad debts based on the receivable figure? It's 12,600 against 252,000 of receivables. Current percentage of bad debts. Twelve thousand six hundred divided by the receivable figure, which is two five two triple zero. So it's five percent. So revised bad debts will be 5% of class 2 receivables, right? And class 2 receivable figure will now be 
zero one six seven zero nine six that's the revised class two receivable figure so the revised bad debts will be eight three five four it was twelve thousand six hundred earlier on and now it will be eight three five four so savings saving in bad debts will be twelve thousand six hundred impact let's calculate the net impact let's calculate the net impact so we'll add the savings first that's the saving figure plus the additional contribution that's a positive figure the additional the saving in the finance cost that's the big figure and from all of this we have to subtract the cost of discount additional discount that's it 27414 so the net impact so What about now? Is it okay now? Okay. So, so there is a net benefit of one eight one zero six eight. I hope it's. I've just calculated the net benefit. All the savings I have added, all the savings, be it the saving in bad debts or it's the saving in finance cost or it's the saving in or it's the additional contribution. I've added all them, all of them, and from this I have subtracted the cost of discount. So we've got net benefit of this proposal. Therefore, we should be accepting it. Yeah, that's a past exam question, but this is quite an old question, quite an old question. Uh, 
by the students. I just love this question as as it's a very good question for clearing the concepts. I hope it's fixed now. Is the voice clear now? Hopefully I don't get this issue again.
Okay, uh, I'm giving you people 20 minutes and let's hope that uh, the voice issue is fixed in 20 minutes. Uh, meanwhile, uh, just Uh, and uh, we'll get back after 20 minutes break. And in case uh, uh, you people are not able to solve any of these questions, we will discuss those questions. So talk to you after 20 minutes. Go through all these questions.
Professor, you are right. <laughs> Hi guys, can you hear me now? Is it clear? Yeah, I hope it continues to be the same. Okay, let's
Hi guys, am I audible now? So welcome back. I hope it, it does not happen again. Uh, so raw material days. For raw material days, we need to have a raw material inventory that is 250,000. And uh, it should be divided by well, uh, Remember one thing that when we have to calculate uh, raw material days, we usually divide it by the raw material used in the production during the period. So remember the original formula for calculating raw material days is the raw material inventory divided by the raw material used during the year for production. But if it's not there, then it's cost of goods manufactured. And if it's not there even, then it's cost of goods sold. One, four, five, eight, triple zero into three sixty five. Sixty three days. No, no, not purchases because first you purchase the raw material and then you issue it for production. So purchase is the previous step, not the next step. When we calculate raw material days, it's it actually tells us how many days it took for this raw material to get issued to the production. So it should be the next stage, not the previous stage. Sixty-three days. Then comes uh, working process days. Again, for working. Uh, now remember, in order to calculate working process days, we divide working process by cost of goods manufactured in case it is given. But in case if it's not given, then it should be cost of goods sold. One four five eight triple zero into three sixty-five. But uh, as far as possible take cost of goods manufactured twenty nine days then comes finished goods days one eight six triple zero and for finished good days it's always the cost of goods sold it's always the cost of goods sold Then comes account receivable days. It's the account receivable balance. It's 345 triple zero divided by the credit sales 1636 365 77 days. Now add all these days. days so that's something we have to subtract so it's 160 days 
we don't have the option. Two fifty thousand raw material inventory is divided by one four five eight triple zero. Okay. Okay, then I think they must have uh, assumed that whatever we have purchased, that's just an assumption. They may have assumed that whatever we have purchased, we have used that raw material in production. So let's try it. So we have to assume that whatever we purchased, we have used that in production. So let's change this figure to 1070. But that's just an assumption. So here we go, 182 days. But that's just a mere assumption that whatever we have purchased, we have used in the production. So the original formula, remember the original formula for raw material days should always be raw material inventory divided by raw material used in production. That's the original formula. Yes, we, we it's, it's just an assumption then. So in an MCQ, you, you always have the option, right? It, he, he, the, the examiner cannot uh, give an answer uh, in which if you use um, pur purchases, you get 182 days. And if you purchase uh, cost of goods sold, you, you, you will get a particular answer and he will give that answer as an option as well. No, it won't happen. So in case cost of goods sold isn't used, then use purchases to see whether the, the 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 answer is matching but most of the times in the exam question uh he, the examiner when when it asks you to calculate raw material days it usually gives the total cost of raw material used in the production so it it usually it, it, the examiner will usually not ask you to assume purchases to be used in case uh, there is a statement called uh like if the examiner gives a statement that there were there were no changes to raw material inventory levels during the period. Even in that case, it means that whatever was purchased was used during the production. But since they haven't given this statement here, this question wasn't that expressive. So I used cost of goods sold in the first place when the answer did not match then I had to assume that purchases should be considered as used in the production. Okay, now we have another question for factoring. Which court has annual revenue on credit of 12 million with an average collection period of three months and a bad debt of 1%? A proposed non-recourse factoring, which means all the bad debts will be saved, is expected to reduce the receivable collection period to two months and will provide cash advances of 40% of the of the value of book debts, that is receivables. The factor will charge a flat fee, inclusive of finance charges 300,000, overdraft interest rate are 12 percent What is the net annual cash cost or benefit of the factoring scheme? So first of all, factors fee, which is the cost, and it is 300,000, and it also includes the finance cost. Okay, 
that's the cost part. Now let's talk about the benefit. The benefit will be saving an administration cost. $40,000 and uh, there might be a saving in the finance cost as well. So we have to do some working. Existing finance cost will be ex equal to existing account receivables into the existing finance rate that is 12 percent so existing collection period is three months and sales figure is 12 million so 12 million into three divided by 12 now one thing that you people should remember is that when collection period is given in months then we have to do all the calculation in months do not use days in that case so in this question it was in three months so three divided by 12 That's going to give us the receivable balance figure into the rate of interest, 12%, $360,000. So credit sales into 3.12, that will be account receivable into 12% of finance cost. Revised finance cost will be the revised account receivable first. Revised account receivable will be 12 million into two upon 12 into 60% because 40% of the receivables will now be financed through the factor. And the cost of that financing is already included in this cost. So we will just be taking the other part of the cost. That is 60% of it. 60% into 12%. That is going to be the revised cost of finance. So saving in finance cost. Will be 216000. That saving will also be treated as benefit. Do we have any other benefit? Yes, we have another benefit of saving in bad debts, which was 1%. It was 1%. So since it's a non-recourse factoring, all of the bad debts cost will be saved. So the total benefits So is it clear?
Now there is a reverse calculation question. Thank you. 